Hallelujah. I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah, and that Jesus Christ is his only Son, a prophet, and Savior of the world, that there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the only Son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God, is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters. Peace be unto you, and God be glorified. And as Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. If you have your Bibles on this blessed uh, Father's Day, and before I move forward, I, I just want to give a shout out to uh, my two children, my son and my daughter, and to let them know that I love them and I praise God for them, and I wish all the blessings and mercies of God upon their life and that they too can do the kingdom work and do it with joy. And I believe I see myself as a fortunate man because uh, I have my son and my daughter in church, and they're both in ministry, and my grandkids are right here beside me. So personally, I don't think it get too much better than that. Now, you may not know what that means until, you ha until your children have children, and then you'll be able to see it from a papa's point of view. Right now, you're just looking at it with your children, but, you know, when your children have children and they're in church, uh, it doesn't get better than that. So the shout out to my son, my daughter, uh, continue to press on and to know that uh, this ain't an easy walk. And if it's easy, you're in the wrong walk. To know that uh, you can live this life. It don't have to be stressful. It don't have to bog you down. You don't have to be mad every day. You can live a clean life for Christ and do the right thing without struggling and sweating all the time. And God has given me as a light, as an example for you to see. And if you just obey instructions, you don't have to go through all the drama you go through. Amen? Come on, give God a hand of praise. <laughs> Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Malachi, chapter 4. We'll be reading verse 5 and 6. I find it interesting in this book of Malachi, chapter 4, reading verse 5 and 6. And it reads and it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And I'm going to use for a text this morning, stopping the dismantling of black manhood and fatherhood, stopping the dismantling of black manhood and fatherhood. Now, the prophet Isaiah, excuse me, Elijah, was the last one to speak in the Old Testament, according to what we believe is the Old Testament. He's the one that said that God was not only ready and willing, but it says in verse 6, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. That's what the prophet said, that the heart of the fathers are going to be bent towards their children. And it's not just one way, and he went on to say, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, which means that the father is going to look 
at the children. His focus is going to be on the children. And the children's focus is going to be on the fathers. There's going to be a great turning. Fathers to children and children to fathers. Then he went on and says, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, what does that mean? It simply means that God is in the business of connecting fathers with their children. But see, when God turned the heart of the fathers to their children, that means that the father gets the first option to try to reach out to his children. But how many know that sometimes fathers can be very, very stubborn and uh, they're still mad at the woman so they don't reach out to the children or they're mad because they wasn't there, they didn't do this? But when God turned that heart, the children's heart will automatically turn to the fathers. So I believe the fathers, in many cases, may have to make the first step. But sometimes the first step is with the children in order to turn the father to the children so the children can be turned to the father. So sometimes the children may have to do that work in order to get the father to turn. Will the church say amen? Now what I find to be interesting on this blessed Father's Day. Remember I told you that Father's Day is tantamount to having a dollar bill in your pocket when you don't have no money. Or let's say a $20 bill in your pocket when you don't have no money. And when you discover it, you're happy. Father's has been getting a bad rap for about the last probably 50 years where uh, everything is now going through the mother or through the woman. And the fathers are just being beat up on the media, beat up everywhere. And as a result of that, the father's role has been dampened. But that's not God's design. You see, the inherent role and purpose within all men is in this order. Let me say it again. The inherent role and purpose of all men is in this order. He is born a male who can become a man, who can become a husband, and who can become a father. Let me say it again. He is born a male who can become a husband, who can become a male who can become a man, who can become a husband, and who can become a father. Everything in life has purpose. The male is the source of seed and the source of human life. Let me say it again. The male is the source of seed and the source of human life. The female is the great incubator who give life through the seed of the man. Her role is to push the seed out. The seed ain't hers. It's to push it out, and whatever her body brings with the seed is put into the child. The purpose is the source of all true fulfillment and define one's existence. Without purpose, life cease to be in existence, but instead becomes an experiment. So if you have no purpose or you have not discovered your purpose, you are living life experimentally because you don't know why you're here. There is a great cry in the land today for real men and fathers to stand up. Our children are being born to men that do not know who they are. They don't know who they are. They don't know who their daddy is. They don't know where they came from. They don't know they have been tricked and bamboozled by people lying to them. They've been tricked and bamboozled by all kind of things that have happened in their life. So they grow up with the mindset, who my daddy is. And they are thirsty for fathers, and they will accept any man that come into their life that will example, be an example of fatherhood. 
So that is the greatest cry in the land today. Children are starved to death for their fathers. Our sons must know that they are males. There should not be any question about their identity. They are males who can become a man. Now, when God made the animals, he labeled them male and female. So because you are male, that does not mean that you are a man. So the progression goes, God has set it in order that he created a male who can become a man, who can become a husband, and who can become a father in that order, but it's not automatic. You see, males, you are born that way, but that don't mean you're a man. To be a man, you must not only accept responsibility, but you must be the responsibility that you are accepting. To be a husband means that you are a house band around the whole house. The Greek word there for husband is house band. If the husband is not there or if he's not in the position that he needs to be while there, he can create chaos even in the house while he's present. But if he's there and he understand his role, that he's supposed to be the house band, that nothing should happen in the house without him being aware of. Nothing, no decision should be made without him being aware of. The children should never be disciplined without him being aware of. Anything that goes on in the house, know this, when God looks at the house, Whenever God looks at the house, the family structure, God never looks at the woman. Because the woman, as it was during Adam and Eve, the woman has no authority when the man is in the house. When the husband in the house. When, when, Adam, and, when Adam, when Eve sinned and ate of the fruit, God was watching. He said nothing. He was observing the situation. And I'm sure God was hoping that this boy wouldn't eat. But the word of God tells us, and as Eve ate of the fruit, she gave to her husband with her, and he did eat. Note here that God says nothing when Eve ate of the fruit. Why? Because Eve was not in the position of authority of the house. The man is always in position of authority in the house, especially if he's saved. You don't get to quit. You don't get to say, well, I didn't know. As R.S. says, ignorance is no excuse. You're supposed to know. So when you are a husband, you are a houseband who can become a father. When you are a husband, you should never be uh, you should never have children until after you've gotten married. Now, people don't like to really deal with, you know, that type of thing because everybody want to do what they want to do. But the order is I'm a male. My, I'm striving to become a man. Then after I strive to become a man, I know years ago you couldn't even approach a woman or approach a man to marry his woman if you didn't have your own place to live, if you didn't have your own transportation, if you didn't have your own job, if you didn't have your own savings account or bank account, no father is going to let his daughter marry a male because that's what he is. If he don't have his own bank account, he don't have his own place to live, he don't have his own job, and if he don't have uh, his own transportation, he's a male. He's not a man. No father would do that. But today... Men are having babies that are males that have never became a man, and we wonder why fatherhood is basically being dismantled. It's because people are just doing what they want to do. So for the men that claim to be fathers, do you have your own place to live? Do you have your own transportation? Do you have your own job? Do you have your own money, your own savings account? 
Because if you don't, you are a male who happens to have children because it's hard to father children when you bouncing from place to place trying to find a place to stay. It's hard to be a father when you ain't together. It's hard to be a father when you don't have, a, you don't have the money you need. So we have a lot of men posing as men, a lot of males posing as men, want to be fathers but don't understand the attributes of it. So I would say to the fathers that are here this morning that understand that don't let your daughter marry someone that don't have those attributes. He's a male. And if he's a male, he must become a man before he marry your daughter. And after he marry your daughter, you got to check in from time to time so you don't slip back into maleness and make sure he maintain manhood. So when it's time for fatherhood to come, he's ready to be a father. Will the church say amen? amen. This process is not automatic. The American culture is truly the cesspool of the world. In particular, when it comes to blacks, blacks have been targeted with a sick pathology of effeminizing our boys and masculizing our girls. This perverted strategy is being used in order to continue gender confusion and for the control purposes. Our children today are still wondering what does it mean to be a man. Our girls are wondering what does it mean to be a woman. We're seeing all kind of sickness that's going on in the world and our kids are confused. Some of our men still today don't know what they want to be. Some of them are dressing up like women, putting on makeup, rouge, and lipstick. Some of them are acting like women, walking around emotionally sprung like women. Every time you look at them, they're crying, don't have no backbone, they're acting like women. Some of them really want to be a woman while sleeping with a man on the down low. These are men that are confused about their identity. You see, some of our children are confused about the role of male and female along with gender identity. And the manhood question in human relations has been a question that has been brought to us in many ways because our culture is transforming what is sexualized versus what is not sexualized culture of sexual transformation today has become the norm. It appears that everything is okay. And our males are trying to fit into what role they want to play. So many of our males are confused. The norm today is L G B T Q E S G. Whatever else that means, I don't know. We now have bisexual, we have transsexual, trisexual, pansexual, bisexual, pedosexual, which will all soon bring us into unisexual, which means one sex. Now, anyone with any sense know that this ain't of God. Anyone with any sense know that God is not in this. This is man and his satisfaction with his sexuality. I'm going to do what I want to do, man says, when I want to do it. So a pansexual can have sex with a man, can have sex with a woman, can have sex with whatever he wants because he says that, you know, this is me. You know, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to love who I want to love. But that doesn't mean that it's right. So our children are growing up in a world today where they're divided on what sexuality means. They're divided on how this works in their daily life. And if our fathers are not being real, real men, exemplifying the character of a man, and our mothers are not being real women, 
exemplifying the characteristics of a woman, therein lies the confusion. If a mother is always dominating a, a father in the presence of her daughter, that's the man she is not going to want to marry. A daughter does not want to marry a weak, spineless Ahab. And the mother, if she's always dogging the man out, the father out in front of his children, for the daughter, that will be the one she don't want. She's going to look for someone the opposite of that. The man must be the head of the house. The woman must play within her role. Her role is to submit. The man's role is to love. Submit thyself, and his role is to submit to God. When he submits to God, then he can rule his household in love. That's how the rulership goes. It's in love. And Jesus said it this way. He said, husband, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So there's no dominating. All it is is a love conversation. Women must love their husband and honor them. You don't honor them by beating them up. You don't honor them by putting them down. You don't honor them by always being right. You don't honor them by putting your children against them. Sometimes women can turn their children against their fathers and have their fathers looking like the bad guy because she want to look like the good person when in actuality, when a woman does that or a man does that, the children is not going to want to be around neither one of you. They're going to run from you both. The sooner they get older to get away from you, they're going to run from you. So the point is, is that you must be in your position, stay in your role, you love, you nourish, you build. The man instructs. And we're going to get more into that as we go on. But here's something else I want you to consider. Some of our children are confused about their roles of males and females along with gender identity. Now, I want to clear this up. You see, when you are born and you have a penis, you are male. Okay, don't be looking out crazy. You've heard worse than that. When you're born and you have a penis, you are male. And your DNA will reflect that. Because you feel effeminate, you are still male. Because you dress effeminate, you are still male. Because you look and talk and act a particular way, you are still male. Your penis is proof that you are male. Your DNA is your assignment as male. So if you call yourself having gender identification struggles, all you have to do is look down below your belt. That's all you have to do. You know that you're a male or female by what God had marked you with. But today... We're having a lot of young people that really don't want to be male or don't want to be female, and they're struggling with gender identity because of their feelings and their emotions. And as a result of that, they're changing themselves, reassigning themselves to stuff that God has never designated for you to be. Get this now, that even when you cut and tuck, even when you change it, your DNA will still reflect what you was born as. So if you were born as male, you can do all the cosmetic work you want. God still sees you as male. So when you are born as a, woman, as a young lady, if you're born and you have a vagina, you are female, and your DNA will reflect that. You may feel masculine at times. You may feel like you can lift up all the weights. You may go in the gym and feel like, well, I'm just as strong as Tom or I'm just as strong as, as James. You may feel, and, and you got to remember that you are a woman. You're a woman with a wound. You are a woman. Man with a wound, okay? So all of the attributes, is, uh, you know, the stuff that man will go through, don't be shocked at times you will go through it. But that doesn't mean that you are a man. You're still a woman. You know, there are some women that can lift more weight than some men without steroids. There are some women that can run faster than a man without steroids. 
There are some women that can uh, do more push-ups than a man without steroids. There are some strong women. There are some women that can do some great things, basketball, football, track and field, and all of that. But that doesn't mean that you are a man. Don't let your feelings get you all caught up where you're trying to change things about your body because you feel that you can do what a man does. You are a female. You're not a male. And don't let some of these girls in these locker rooms, you know how sometimes you're playing sports and you have girls in the locker room looking at other girls in the locker room, and while looking at one another, they kind of get a feel like, well, she cute, and, you know, uh, she got a nice body, and what happens is uh, they think because they notice another girl's body, like guys in the locker room, you know, you may see a guy may have them shoulders on him, and he may look handsome and all that. Because you observe somebody, how they look, and you admire how they look, does not mean that you are a homosexual. When you're young, that's what young people do. Doesn't mean you're homosexual. Doesn't mean because you see bodies, first time seeing naked bodies in the shower, naked bodies uh, when you get from the football field or naked bodies from the basketball field or soccer field or, or whatever field you're on because you're seeing naked bodies and you're observing it doesn't mean that you're a lesbian or homosexual. What it simply means is that you've seen a body that does not look like yours. And what happens is many times you have sick, twisted people that will see stuff like that and try to nudge you into some confusion now got you thinking one thing when it's never was your design. God has never called you to be what he, in other words, if you have a penis, you are male with the possibility of becoming a man. If you have a vagina, you are female. There is no confusion with that. Don't let nobody try to confuse you with that. And if you do, what happens is you try to reassign yourself and create something for yourself that God has never created. How many hear what God just told you? How many understand that? That's what you need to be explaining to your sons and to your daughters. They need to know that it's okay to be what their gender assignment has been assigned to them by God. Amen? So I want to clear up that confusion. You may get a gender reassignment surgery to become male or female, but your real assignment was given to you by God, which is reflected in your DNA, and it will never change. I want you to get that. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been seeing a lot of young people lately that are confused about their sexual identity. And I'm, in my head, I'm thinking, how can you be confused when all you got to do is look below your waistline? The reason why they're confused is because they're lining up with other people that are confused. And if you're lining up with other people that are confused, you're going to be confused because now you're thinking that what you are is really not who you are. Now you're blaming God. You're saying God made a mistake. God, God made a mistake by putting this marker on me. What is the marker? Why, by putting a penis on me, he made a mistake because somehow he had to know that I wanted to be a woman. Can everybody say, God makes no mistakes? Come on, talk back to him and say, he makes no mistakes. See, because you feel like a woman don't mean you're one. Because you feel like a man don't mean you're one. Because your emotions have a tendency to be up and down doesn't mean that you need to change your whole body type to fit your emotions. And there are some already that have already had gender identification transfers, and now they want to go back to what the DNA says. Well, you can go back, but you won't have what you had before you left it. So the point is, just be happy with who you are. You don't have to be a pansexual. You don't have to be a transsexual. You don't have to be a bisexual. You don't have to be all of these other sexual things in order to try to make yourself fit in. That is all of the devil. He made a male and female. This other garbage, and that's what I said, garbage, this other garbage is meant to confuse, and it comes to confuse because the enemy, Satan, is trying to keep you from procreation. Because the more you procreate, the more babies come into the world, that means that they have a chance to become kingdom citizens and affect the devil's kingdom. Hear me now. See, he's trying to reduce your numbers 
and up his numbers. If he can get his numbers up with all these wicked things, then the kingdom of God numbers will go down. And that's, where, that's the battle. The battle is over souls. It has always been over souls. So what, what Lucifer want to do is to get you confused and get you all mad, get you frustrated, so you won't look at what God is doing. You'll focus on what he's doing. So God wanted me to tell you that you and I, we have to stop the dismantling of black manhood and black fatherhood. How do we do that? We need our men to be real men. We need our daughters to be real women. We, we need us to be what we need to be so our children can grow up and be what they need to be. How many can receive it? Hallelujah. So you can get a reassignment surgery, but that's in the natural. In God's eyes, he see you as what he made you. Now just think about that. Think about the people that have had reassignment surgery, but now they want to change. They want to they switch back. Because no matter how you dress, you can put a monkey in dresses, and you can put a wig on his head, and you can put lipstick on his lips and earrings on his ears. But how many know the monkey still going to be the monkey? Your DNA will call for you. Uh, Sometimes there are men and women that have transferred over and forgot that they supposed to be a, a woman, and that man come out in their voice. You better leave me alone, you know. The man show up. God is not going to change his DNA because of your feelings and emotions. Amen? So we're talking about fatherhood. We cannot, as black males and black females, we, we cannot say that, you know, we're dressing like women and dressing like men, and then you want everybody to respect you in the community when you're giving off this negative light as of a black woman or a black man. You know, I was walking down the street a, a, a few weeks ago and, you know, doing some shopping in certain areas. And w what I noticed was that now you're routinely seeing women that look just like men. I mean, they got them broad shoulders. They, didn't, you know, they just look like men. And they want you to treat them like men. You know, uh, I call myself trying to open doors up, you know, for a woman. And, and uh, well, sir, I, I really don't need you to open up my door. And when I got a closer look at her, I saw why. She, she want to be seen as a man. And there are some men that are walking around with tight jeans on and tight everything on, pants sagging, walking around. And, and, and the fallacy in this is that some of them already have children. They already have children but acting like a woman. But want you to respect them like a man. Isn't that a paradox? We live in a time now where, uh, especially in the black community, everything is up for grabs. We got men got making billions of dollars, at least millions, dressing up like women, acting like women, talking like women, being comedians like women. Like somehow, you don't get to that level of doing that unless something has taken place within you. There's something on the inside of you that just ain't right. What, what man want to dress up like a woman? What man want to act like a woman? It's not natural. You can't make it natural. So the enemy is trying to feminize our men and trying to masculize our women. But will the church say the devil is alive? Now, you know who they are. You got Tyler Perry. You had Flip Wilson. You got Jamie Foxx. You got all these guys running around not knowing that children are very impressionable. And if you're funny doing it, then maybe they want to try it. Now they're funny doing it. And before you know it, you don't know who's who. Men walking around, you know, looking like they can tap the world. And a grown man walking around looking like he, you know, just need a hug. I saw a man just the other day, and my heart went out to him. I was, I was a little on the sad side. I said, God, what's going on? I mean, he was just as tall as I was, just as thick as I am and broad shoulders and everything, and he had on this loud jumpsuit and switching while walking down Belleville. I'm like, uh, you know, what's up? I call it a brain virus, a brain virus, a brain confusion, where you have been tricked to believe that it's okay to be that way. Listen here now. I know you may have some friends. You may know some people. I get all that. But somebody needs to tell them what they're doing is wrong. 
that is not of God. And fatherhood and manhood is being dismantled because we have people supporting it. Oh, that's okay. Be who you want to be. You're fine. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Love who you want to love. Go where you want to go. Ain't nothing wrong with that. The Bible said love everybody. Just love who you want to love. And what happens many times, we have Christians and sometimes pastors and leaders in the church are dismantling manhood because they're supporting things that has nothing to do with manhood. And in many cases, our communities are suffering because people are clapping for this mess. And even in their heart, they know it's wrong. How many of you can understand that I would say at least 90% or 95% of all homosexuals know what they're doing is wrong? They already know it. They don't need you to tell them how bad it is. They just need you to present truth. They already know it. They already know what they're doing is wrong. So my job is not to to crucify them. My job is to present truth to them that that ain't right, that what you're doing is wrong, especially if you call yourself want to be male or female. The purpose of the father is to be a progenitor, a progenitor. The word pro, the prefix pro, means to support or uphold. That's the prefix pro, a progenitor. That is to support or uphold. The word genitor means generation. So a progenitor, which is a man, is to support and uphold his generation. That's what manhood is about. You can't do that if you're switching. Matter of fact, you won't be a progenitor because your seed would be going into another man and, and under unisexualization, that simply means that you won't have seed. So it's hard to support and uh, uphold w what's in you when in fact you're releasing it into the drought. So to be a father, a father is a serious thing because we get to have children. We get to support them. We get to raise them. We get to love them. A father is, is, is not someone that's just going through the motion. It's, it's, it's real work. You got to put time in to be a good father. So when we get to support, remember progenitor, the word means to support, the prefix pro means to support or to uphold. Genitor means generation. So the word Abba, Abba means both. Father in these two words are ten rules for a fatherhood. I'm going to give them to you quickly. Number one, if you're going to be a father, you must have love for yourself. How can you father your children when you hate yourself? Well, you quickly say, well, I love myself. Well, how do you love yourself? You love yourself by what you do to yourself. Loving yourself means not, not drinking, not smoking, not getting high, not doing crime, not doing drugs. That's how you love yourself. Your children need to see self-love come from you. So to the fathers that are listening, you say you love yourself, but what are you doing to show your children you love yourself? When the last time you've been to the gym? When the last time you walked, when the last time you ate some good food, when the last time you did something with them. Loving yourself is a part of being a good father. That's Mark chapter 12, verse 31. Number two, he must command his children in love. You don't command your children by hollering and screaming and cussing at them and talking crazy to them. That ain't love, that's you. You must command your children in love. Children will only respond to love. You can beat them all you want to, but children need to see the reflection of God in you. See, God loves us, and he chastened us, but his chastisement is in love. But you can't do it when you're confused about who your, who your role is. You can't do it as, well, I think I'm a woman, so I'm going to let the man handle it, and the man you point to is your wife. You can't do it when you're confused in your identity. Children need their father to correct them, but you can't do it if you don't believe you're the father. You can't do it if you're acting like Ahab. 
and Jezebel running everything. Well, I can't go nowhere until I talk to Jezzy. Jezzy, what you think I need to do? And Jezzy said, just get over in the corner somewhere and sit down and be quiet until I tell you to speak. See, if, if, if you are an Ahab, and let me tell you how you get Ahabs. Ahabs come because they always divert responsibility to Jezebel. Ahab is self-made. Ahab runs from responsibility. You cannot be a good father if you're running from responsibility. If you're running from responsibility, you cannot be a good father. So what did Ahab do? When Ahab found out that the prophet had killed all, that Elijah had killed all of the Baal prophets, I think roughly 400 of them, he had killed them all. Jezebel was waiting on him to respond. The servant came in and shared that all of the prophets had been killed. Jezebel and Ahab sitting on the throne. Jezebel looked at Ahab and Ahab didn't say a word. So what did she do? She sent a letter to the prophet and said, By this time tomorrow you shall be as one of them. Men make Jezebels. Hear me now. Men make Jezebel. Most women don't want to be in a man position. They're only in a man position is because the woman has taken that position from the man. And when I say taken, I mean that the man has allowed her to be in that position. And now that she's in the position running things, then the first thing you say is that, you know, she won't let me do nothing. No, you gave her your position. You put her in that position. You told her it's okay for her to do certain things. But yet, when your sons and your daughters look at your situation, they see mama as a man and you as a woman. And you wonder why you get no respect. Holler back if you hear me. You wonder why you get no respect because they don't see you as the person that is running the house. They see you as a person that's following what mom says. You know, years ago it wasn't that way. So Jezebel has taken over because Ahab gave her the keys. Ahab said, you drive, I watch. So number two, he must command his children in love. Genesis 50, verse 16 through 17. Number three, he must instruct, guide, and warn his children in love. You can't say you love your children when you're not instructing them. You got to instruct them. Instruct them. You got to guide them. You got to do all of this in love. It can't be threats. Today, threats doesn't work with kids anyway because they're threatened every day at school. They come home to you and you threaten it. That's just another threat. Okay, yeah, whatever. Dad, won't you get out of my room? Dad, mom, stop coming in my room with your threatening self. They don't believe nothing you say because every time you say something, you never keep it. The kids are, are experts at turning parents against each other. You always have the parent. We're talking about fatherhood now. We're talking about uh, stopping the dismantling of black manhood and fatherhood. Most of the time in households, the, 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 the enemy want to always divide the father from the mother because the, the kids want the least, they want to go to the path of least resistance. Your kids do not want discipline. So they go to the path of least resistance. If it's the mother, that's where they're going. If it's the father, that's where they're going. They want the path of least resistance. Well, how do they get the path of least resistance? It's because they're specializing at dividing the mother and the father. And as long as the mother and the father are divided on discipline, the children sit back and clap their hands and say, we winning. Why? Because they're going to go to the path of least resistance. Instead of the mother trying to run it, she needs to submit to the father. Well, some women say, well, what if you don't know what he's doing? Remember, mothers, your job is to help him to know what he's doing. That's why God assigned you to him. You are his help meet. It doesn't say overthrow. It doesn't say commit treason. It doesn't say blindside him. 
It doesn't say make him look bad. And some women love to specialize. Whenever the kids are around, they love to put their husband down, put the man down, just to make him look bad in front of the kids as a way of making themselves look good. There's some wicked mothers as there are some wicked fathers. They want all of the children love, and they get jealous when the children gravitate to their fathers. Now, you can't stop it because of Scripture. The Scripture says this. It says that fathers are children's glory. Look to your neighbor and say, don't be hating. That's a fact. When you get through doing your flips, women, when you get through doing through all these things you try to do to make your kids love you more than they love their father, the scripture says that when the father walk in the house, when the father show up, the father are the children's glory. Now, women, he didn't leave you out. He also said that the glory of the man is his wife. See, you thought you was left out, but you want it all. You want to be, you want to be uh, the children's glory and the glory of your husband. You just want all of it. But you're, you are the glory of your husband. So, but if we don't know that, then we raise our kids trying to compete. Look to your neighbor and say, don't compete for love. If you're competing for your children's love, you both have already lost. Now, you can find that in Proverbs 26, verse 6, Hosea 11, Hosea 11, 1 through 4. Number 5. Is that number 5? Number 3. So I'm at number 4. Number 4, then forget about the scripture I gave you. Go to 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12. That's number 3. Number four, you must train your children in love. The scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he get old, he will not depart from it. Train your children in love. If you don't train your children in love, how are they going to learn love? How are they going to walk in love if you don't train them in love? Train your children in love. That's Proverbs 22, verses 6, and Hosea 11, verse 1 through 4. Number 5, you must rebuke your children in love. That's Genesis 34 and 30. Rebuke your children in love. Whatever your children are doing, you have to rebuke them. That means to, you have to do those things that you can rebuke them so they grow up understanding discipline. Our children today are most children, especially black children, and it wasn't like this here years ago. When our children went to classroom, the teachers used to be calling the parents and saying, your child is so mannerable. Your child is acting so good. Years ago, they would give out uh, lollipops and give extra credit and work all kind of stuff out for the kid that was acting good in the class. And the teacher would have things such as uh, best student week or something along that line. The kids would know how to act. Well, the reason why 99.9% of the kids don't know how to act at school is because they act the fool at home. Playing parents, and you got parents fussing at each other, where you don't have to hit him that hard, or you don't have to discipline him like that. And, and what you do, if you don't train him up, the scripture says train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he get old, he will not depart from it. What you miss in that, if you train him up, that's the promise. In the way he should go, God will keep him in the promise. What happens is we don't train him. Why? Because it's too difficult. You want everything to be smooth all the time. Leave him alone. He all right. They're just kids. Leave him alone. Let him play. Let him tear up the house. Let him jump out of windows. Let him parachute off the roof. Let him just eat anywhere they want to eat. Let them cuss you out when they want to cuss you out. Let them talk. They're just growing. That ain't training. The word train means to make do. You may want to write that down. You got to make them do. You don't ask them to. You ask a child, do you want to go to bed? And the child say, no, I don't want to go to bed. Stop making your boys out of punks. Stop making your girls out of bull daggers. You got to train them. That simply means you got to put time in with them. You got to make them do. Don't ask them to. 
You got the nerve to ask your kid, do you want to go cut the grass? No, I, I don't feel like cutting the grass. How old are you? I'm 17. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm getting ticked even thinking it. You wonder why your boy's soft? Because they're always under somebody's soft. Wonder why they won't ever stand up and be a man? They can be in your house and be 25 years old and talk about, Mommy, what you going to cook me today? I didn't say 5 or 15. I said 25. You wonder why they won't ever leave your house? Because you've never cut them off for your umbilical cord. You still got them on your paps. And you wonder why when they get older they can't stand you. Because, see, when boys grow up, they grow up and understand when they see other men, they say, you mean that's what I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> that's what I'm supposed to be. And they discover that they've been babied too long. And they get mad at the person that's babying them. That's men and women. So you must rebuke your children in love. Rebuke means stop doing that. Don't do that anymore. Leave that alone. When I say move, you do it. We want to be our children's friend, but a father, a good father will never want to be his children's friend. That ain't, that, ain't, that ain't how you do it. I remember my son when he was 12, 13 years old, he came up to me and said, Daddy, you're my best friend. And I got mad. I said, no, I'm not your best friend. You're not going to try that deception on me. He didn't know he was trying to, he didn't know that's what was happening. But I said, no, I'm not your best friend. When you get your house, when you get a car, when you get, your, when you get a job, when you're doing what you need to do and stand up and pull your pants up as a man, then I think about being your best friend. We make the mistake of letting our kids deceive us. I like you, daddy. I love you. I love you. I love you, daddy. I love you, mama. Something coming. <laughs> you ain't got to believe me. Something coming. They're giving it to you early because you're going to catch hell later. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you don't be your kids' friends. If you're going to be a father, be a father. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Be the message that you bring. You can't have it both ways. You're a father, call yourself being a father at home, but your kids, you tell them now, uh, you need to be in the bed with your eyes closed at 9 o'clock. But they go to bed when they want to go to bed. Well, you can't make it. Yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. See, you don't want the confrontation. And since you don't want the confrontation, you obfuscate your responsibility. Most people that don't want, the don't want the confrontation, they'll let you by. They'll let you slide. But how many of you know that when you get on the street, when them cops say, get out the car, boy, and they give you one of them, look, get out the car, get back, put your hand behind your head, put your hand behind your head so we can handcuff you. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm tired. You what? You tired? So he ain't going to ask you but one or two times. If he asks you two times, by the time, all, all he's going to do is say, okay, resisting arrest, snatch out the car. And you know what Donald Trump said? Donald Trump said, don't bring him out the car nicely. Make sure the head hit the steel. When you're putting him in the car, you got to hear some noise going on the head, going in the, in the car. Boom, boom, put him on in. So you wondering why some of our kids getting beat down, shot down, and all this stuff is because the fathers was not there or they was there but didn't make their children do what they were supposed to do. Said, so train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he get old, he will not depart from it. As fathers, our job is to make them do not ask them to. And that's how we're dismantling black manhood and fatherhood. 
We're just mounting it because fathers are giving their responsibility to the mama. When you give the responsibility to the mother, a mother will never raise a man. Ever. My father was never in my home. But what I loved about my mother to this day, third grade education, PhD in wisdom, this woman had enough sense, enough sense when Jimmy, Benny, and I was acting the fool, shoulders getting big, getting taller, getting stronger, she realized she didn't want to wrestle with us no more. My mother would walk down the street, go to Mr. Johnson's house, and say, Mr. Johnson, these boys are getting a little big now. I can't handle them like I used to handle them. You know, I used to put the head between my leg and wear that behind out. I can't do that no more because they're just getting a little too big for me. And Mr. Johnson said, well, Miss uh, Bertha, what you need? So I need you to come down and get these boys some discipline. He said, what do they do? Well, you know, they're not getting their work done, and they're not doing what they need to do. And Mr. Johnson said, okay, well, Miss Bertha, uh, give me about 20 minutes. I'll be on down. He get through doing what he's doing. He come down, big old tall strapping guy. He walks in the house, and he didn't, he didn't ask for any reason. He said, now, uh, your mama tell me y'all ain't been doing what y'all need to be doing down here, huh? Now, uh, you know, we don't live like this in this community, so uh, I got to do what I got to do. Now, who's going to be first? And, and we start crying. Now, I, I don't want to hear none of that. Who's going to be first? Now, I, I got, got things to do, and uh, I'm here to do what your mama asked me to do. And you just might as well just go and bend on over and get this thing over with. You ain't going to talk him out of it. It, it ain't going to be one of those parties that you're going to cry and holler and all that. And I'm with my daddy. I'm your daddy right now. <laughs> he ain't say nothing. You just bend over. And, and you know what I tell you? When they start crying, that's when the whooping begins. You ain't going to trick nobody. You're going to let a couple of tears out like somebody's supposed to stop whooping you. When they start crying, that's when the whooping begins. Then you give about a good eight, nine, ten good ones after that, then, then they understand. Mama used to give us a whooping for hire. She recognized that she was not the man. But she found a man that could give us discipline. And to this day, I'm so thankful for him. I'm thankful for Mr. Johnson because the last thing I wanted to hear, y'all better act right, Mr. Johnson will be here tomorrow. Leave me alone, Jimmy. Stop, Benny. <laughs> now get out there and cut that grass. Okay, Mama. Go out there and pick them weeds out of the garden. Yes, ma'am. Why? We don't want Mr. Johnson showing up because Mr. Johnson don't talk to you. He don't get on this and say, now, boy, you know, I really don't want to do all this. Now, he ain't doing none of that. He's on assignment. Bend over and take this whooping. So what happened when women let men be men and raise their sons and their daughters? See, women can't raise a man. Her best day, she can't raise a man because his emotions is different from yours. Boys will never become a woman, even when they try to become one. They still ain't one because our emotions are wired. We're wired differently. Only a man can tap into that and understand that this boy needs this. This boy needs more structure. This boy needs more guidance. This boy needs more attention. This boy needs to do more work. This boy... Men know that on sight. We know what a child will need as a boy. And especially if he's your son. You're going to know, don't baby him. He need to do this. Because when he get into the real world, the real world is not going to coddle him. The real world is not going to put their paps in his mouth. He's not going to be on a pacifier in the real world. They're going to put them sticks upside his head. And if he ain't careful, he'll get 
a few bullets in his body. That's what I said, a few bullets in his body. Why? Because he have not learned discipline. And if you don't learn discipline, remember, I worked in prison for 20, 25 years. And I've seen boys that come back and forth to jail and prison for one reason. Discipline. They know what they're going to do. They know when they get up. They know when they go to bed. They have a job. They have assignment. So prison become a place where they get structured. And there are many young African-American males or black males go back to prison because they know they're going to have structure. With that structure, they can function. But living with you, they can't function. Boys love structure. That's what makes boys thrive. And this wicked prison system has figured it out. And when they get to jail in prison, they give them three hots in a cot. They tell them when to wake up, when to go to bed, when to work, what to do, how to do it, and all of that. And they just keep coming back home. So why is the recidivism rate so high? It's because they're getting structure that you won't give them at home. Now, somebody going to believe this and somebody's not, but it's a fact. Some people are going to continue doing what they're doing and wonder why your kid's in and out of jail and prison. Let me give you this one. Where are we at, number six? Number six, a father must restrain his children in love. That's 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. You got to restrain your children. You don't get to abuse your children. Number seven, he must chasten his children in love. That means discipline his children in love. That's Hebrews 12, 17, Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. Number eight, a father must nourish his children in love. That is to build them up. There are some men, that, some boys that have never received a hug from their father. And when they finally get a hug from a man, it feels so good to them until they think they're gay. They literally think they're gay. I really, that was a nice hug. I, I never felt, the, I never felt like that. Well, that's what your daddy should have gave you a long time ago. But because a man finally hugs you and embraces you, now you flirting with your identity because you never had the love of a father. And as a result, because you got a hug from a man, now you think you funny. Or the same is true with some women. They get a hug from another woman. And, you know, some people, when they hug, they hug tight. Some people hug long. Some people just want to hug you to the point where they're getting all in you. I don't need those kind of hugs. I'm secure. I know who I am. Come here, Minister Fergo. Be quick, be quick. See. I don't need all this. I don't need all that. That ain't what I need. What, I, what I'm good with is this right here. That's it. Holler back. I don't need all that. Because if, if it's coming to me that way, it ain't about me, it's about you. Okay? Now, now if that's what you need, then identify it. Say, I need a big hug. That's okay, but identify. But just know with some people, you can be going beyond your boundaries with them. Some people, it's boundary issues, be it your father or your mother. It's boundary issues. So just identify. I need a big hug. But you have to understand that if you're hugging someone, if you never received a hug from your father, like my son, he get big hugs. He's a big hugger. I just need to know the identification. <laughs> okay. I ain't taking nothing from him. Identify. Because <laughs> I don't like to be smothered. Not just by him or a woman or anybody. I kind of have my space. I don't, even, I don't even hug my daughter like that. Come here, baby. I don't hug my daughter like that. She my daughter. You know, I may give her one of these just like that. Then I may, 
I may do that. That's a woman. I know it's on the mic, but <laughs> that's a woman. So if I'm not all this with, <laughs> with a woman, holla back. <laughs> How I many you know that I'm not trying to be all this and rotating and, and spinning around with a man? That ain't what I'm trying to do. I ain't do my wife that way. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that if you never receive hugs from your father and you are a man, when you finally get a manly hug from another man, Many times it can be misinterpreted. The man think, what's all this about, player? What's up? You know, and, and if he borderline and he like it and you like it, hey, uh, do you mind if we meet next week? <laughs> you don't know what you're going to get back, amen? Hallelujah. So we stopped at number eight. Number eight, he must be nourished by his children in love. He must nourish his children in love. Nourishment simply means that you're, you're spending time with them. You're building them up. You're talking to them. You're giggling with them. You know, you're not being a clown with your children. Your children don't want a clown. Your children want someone they can feel comfortable talking to. You know, you know at, they want someone they can talk to, especially if he's a male and she's a female. You know, you, you can talk about everything without being buggered. You know, talk real to them. Say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's going to happen. That's the role of a father. Your daughter should not be surprised by anything. The only surprise she should have is a surprise you didn't tell her. That would be it. Well, he didn't tell me that. But <laughs> you know, that should be the surprise. So you nourish them. You build them up. Number nine, a father must supply their needs in love. You're not going to work because you're just going to work. You're going to work so you can supply the needs of your children and your wife. That's why you go to work. That's why I put up with all the mess I put up with for 25 years, working around clan members and working around everybody else, is because it was about loving my wife and loving my children. I had to make sure that I was doing well my part. You don't get to quit because somebody hurt your feelings. You don't get to get mad, and you know how some people say, well, I, I, I don't need this job anyway. I need this job. I have another one tomorrow. Okay, Scooter, how did that work for you? <laughs> tomorrow, you done went through 365 days of tomorrow, and you still don't have a job. Don't be trying to act tough on your job when you got kids. Humble yourself, submit yourself. You do what you should have taught your kids to do. Submit yourself. Okay, I'll do it. And do it. Amen? Amen. So you must, a father will, must supply the children's needs and his family needs in love. That's Matthew chapter 7, verse 8 through 11. Number 8 was Isaiah 1 and 2. Okay? You got to understand that these are things that you got to do. Okay, so we're on number nine. Okay, number ten. A father will, should not provoke his children to become angry. He said, well, how do you provoke your children to become angry? You can provoke them to become angry by not supplying their needs. You can provoke them to become angry because of your low self-esteem. Whenever you see a father fussing and arguing with his kids, it's not the children's fault. Now know this, and you've heard me say this many times, understand this here, is that I never blame children. If anything going wrong with a child, in my head, it's not the child's fault. It's these crazy parents' fault. The father that's not being what he need to be, the mother that's not being what she need to be, and as a result of that, the children are trying to figure it out. And when they're trying to figure it out, they're going to do some things that they shouldn't do. They're going to say some words they shouldn't say. They're going to go places that they shouldn't go. Just as God looks at me as the head of my house, whenever there's an issue in the house, you know, I, 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 really, I really don't blame my wife. 
That's not, I'm not wired for that. I start to look inwardly. What did I do wrong? What am I doing wrong? What's going on with me? She's just reacting to me. So a lot of time our children are reacting to you. You're thinking you got a bad child, but no, it's you. You're not doing what you need to do. You're not focusing on what you need to focus on. And you want to label your kids bad when you're the one that created that badness. You're the one that created it. You're the one that caused it. You don't get to say, I have bad children, but I'm a great parent. You can't have it both ways. You got to take ownership of it. You got to realize that you played a role in it. And you got to straighten out. And as you straighten out, your children will straighten out. Amen? So, as God has given you that word, we need to keep in mind that we should not, as black people, or even Caucasian, or any race group, but in particularly blacks, because we're the ones that I believe that are suffering the most in this situation. We must stop dismantling black manhood and fatherhood. And one of the best ways to do that is to love our children as we love ourselves. And self-love is the key to bringing forth great manhood and fatherhood so our children will know what, it, what, what does it look like to be a man or what does it look like to be a woman. If you can receive it and believe it, stand to your feet and give God a hand praise in the house of God. And bless Father's Day to all the fathers. Hallelujah. Is there one this morning?